Welcome back to the Electronic Aramite Reviews. I'm your host, the Electronic Aramite. And now, I'm going to talk to you about, and you're going to think we're going back in time to when the Electronic Aramite was in college. I'm going to talk to you about Risk Legacy, or I don't want to pick up the box because it'll, there we go, there, Risk Legacy. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a higher end beginning than usual. Usually I just jump in and show you the pieces. Risk Legacy is a very special game. It is the game, and, and you've likely heard about it, but it is a game of risk that has been altered significantly so that every game you play will impact the board. You will write on your board using, using a pen or a marker. You will possibly rip up cards. You will definitely rip up cards. You will put stickers on your board that will make this board different for the next games. So it is a game that evolves, but it is a game in which you actually change your board, you actually mess with your components, some components you will trash forever, and some components you will alter by putting new stickers on. And so it is a game that changes depending upon the decisions of the players, either the winners or the losers. Everybody gets to make a decision, typically. Actually, everybody gets to make a decision. Everybody gets to make a decision. Even if you completely lost and were wiped out, everybody gets to make a decision. Now, if you are afraid of spoilers, because this game is largely driven by discovery, by what comes next, because you don't know what's going to come next as a player to, to impact the board. You don't know. Your actions will change things and not always. Some things you do know. But mostly, there are some special cool things that you don't know. Now, I'm going to be honest. I've played about five or six games of this, and I don't know them all. I haven't played them all on the same board, and I'll, get to, I'll talk about that at the end. I don't know them all. So I can't comment on the end game awesomeness, and I don't want to, not in this review, because I want to try to keep this review as spoiler-free as possible, because part of this game Part of the fun of this game that's going to keep you playing it is the discovery, the new things, the what's coming next. And you might play two or three games and nothing will happen new other than just the, the regular things that you know are going to happen at the end of every game. But you might then get to that fourth game and then something very, very, very awesome happens and you don't want me to tell you about that. And I may not even know about that. And I don't want you to tell me about that. So there are going to be a few spoilers that just come from looking at the board, and, and so if you're spoiler-free, if you don't want any spoilers, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you my summary of what I think about the game right now. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful game. And it's an addictive, crazy game that, you're, that you've got to go back to your old college days to enjoy. You know, back when the times, or, or your old, even maybe even your younger days, if you really liked Risk back in the younger days, to enjoy. It's taking some of that cool, simple gameplay and adding the complexity of changing your board and also making it into a streamlined experience where you aren't playing Risk for seven hours just to finish that one game. In this game, you can play Risk in about an hour. And that is a wonderful thing. And at the end of that hour, something cool is going to happen. No matter what, something cool is going to happen. And you're going to want to play again. So if you want complete spoiler free, I'm going to say, give this Risk a chance and buy it and have a ton of fun. It is an innovative way of doing things. It is a, a new way of looking at the board game genre, of customizing the board. I think we're going to see this, this be something that appears in other things. Maybe not just Hasbro, but in other games. I think you're going to start seeing this mechanic pop up in other places, sort of like the deck building mechanic. And I hope it does, because I think it's really fun. It takes a special type of person, and you really have to throw some of that old, oh my gosh, I can't, this is pristine board game, and I can't, ch believe me, I'm a pristine board game person, but I can still handle this. So if you want no spoilers, my answer is, you will like this game if you like the Ameritrash run, roll the game, and you like to have a lot of fun, and you have a relatively stable gaming group. So there's my summary. You can turn it off right now if you don't want to see anything. If you do want to see the board, knowing that there are just a few spoilers, nothing huge, but just a few spoilers, I am going to show you that right now. 
All right, the first thing you'll notice is that the box is sort of like a briefcase. So you open it up and then it comes with, what is this? Are we back in our childhood? It comes with stickers. These are money stickers. We barely even use the money stickers. It comes with these. These are minor city stickers and you've got major city stickers. You've got some uh, alterations of your bonuses got some fortifications, and then these are things that you do in before your first game. You'll also notice, oh this is a nice little player, these are your these are your player sides. They also get at the very beginning of the game before you start a sticker that will give them a special power. And I'm not going to tell you what those special powers are. They're not anything huge. Do not think this is going to um, change risk into some sort of Twilight Imperium style strategy. There's stuff that are extremely situational. I'll give you just one. Something like if you happen, if you're an attacker and you roll double sixes, you automatically win the battle. And there you go. If you if they don't, if the defender doesn't roll a six. So if you win on a double six, then suddenly you've you've won that battle and, and you no longer have to fight. It's very situational. Stuff like that. I mean it's nothing. That's that's pretty much it. It's nothing that is going to completely overbalance. Now you'll notice I have another sticker here, and I'm not gonna tell you how. I necessarily got that and what it does. But you will get more powers. There are more slots of different colors. Blue, orange, yellow, and red. I don't even know where, where these all come from. But by the end, I think you are going to see a bit of a different type of risk. One that the factions have different powers, different abilities, different things going on. And I think it's going to be sort of this wild it's not I don't again not going to change it into some sort of uber strategy game where all the sides have these crazy things but i think it's going to to make it into a much more customized version of risk where your sides are cool and the people you're going to want to play the same sides over and over i think the same people because that's just going to be you know your baby and you've you've made that baby more powerful now you'll notice this comes with a i'm going to try i'm going to block this out cuz i don't want you to see that this comes with a nice little little packet here that tells me to do something. Okay, I'll let you see that. This is to open the first time a faction is eliminated from the game. So we've done that. We've eliminated a faction from the game. There are a, So you'll tear off this from the box. You'll see there are several more, and I'm not going to go through those. But uh, there are several more. And inside there are nice new cards that will give you newer things to do, neat things to do, change the game up some more. So as things happen, faction get eliminated, open up a pack. Oh my gosh, and it becomes this thing where you want to eliminate a faction because you want to know what's in that pack and what it's going to do. And you then you want to do it because the things inside that are going to add to the game. So after, even after you've opened the pack, that that's going to alter your gameplay just so that you make sure that you get new stuff happening. This is a nice little map. This is not really necessary, but it's neat that where you're going to put your, your, your country cards and then they're going to come out. You draw them from here and come out. Then there's going to be just a general money card and that will, uh, if you don't own the country, you can just get a gold piece and that also, if that ever, in, if that ever uh, needs to be reshuffled, then you're going to have uh, somebody get a victory point, which are nice. They've added a red star victory point system to the game, to risk, where now you no longer have to destroy everybody to win the game. Now you just need to get four red stars. That makes the game so much faster. You'll notice that you, it's neat. We, the undersigned, take responsibility for the wars that are about to start, the decisions we will make, and the history we will write. Everything that is going to happen is going to happen because of us. And you want your playing group to sign it, and then the war started and you date it. What's really neat about this, and I was thinking of this from a sentimental, one of my gaming group members is my father. And he, I actually got this for him for Christmas, and then he got me a copy later, and I'll tell you why. Uh, as I when I talk to you at the end but so I know and these are my good friends that I play with so I know that 10 years down the line we probably won't play this game anymore or you know maybe we will just for fun occasionally whatever we're all gonna go different places and maybe not see these people as much but I can always pull this out look at those names and and read that and say you know I remember when we did that and when we changed the board and and it will become almost a memory rather than just a, a game that we played and had fun. So I think for a nostalgia, 
Now there's more, here's some more stuff, and this is what really is, you know, this is, this is plaguing me right here, because I want to know what's in there, and I don't know, and I'm not going to tell you, this is a spoiler free anyway, so we're not going to say what's in there, I don't even know, let's pretend, and yeah, whatever. Changes the game dramatically, I do know that much. So, that's going to be cool stuff. And you get a lot of neat things, you get, I think, Step it up a little bit from the wrist. Each side corresponds to one of those, one of those sides, and they have these neat plastic minis. Smaller. These guys are kind of. I think they look like the guys from uh, Halo, or oh, these no, these are the guys that look like the StarCraft Marines. Of course, they're not gonna, not going to zoom in for you. There we go. They've got little bulbous, bulbous sides, and then this is their. This means three men, and these are these are just singlets. And they all are different. I don't think I need to necessarily pull those out for you and take the time to do that. They all are different, and they're neat, and they're, I think that adds some coolness to this. It's just like the, these people look like Fremen. They're like women. They're Fremen. They kind of have the sand dune kind of looking thing. They have little speeder bikes. These guys are, these do look like the Halo troopers, and they've got mechs for their threes. you got these guys. These are, <laughs> these are the best. They look like sort of Gaelic barbarians, and then their threes are men riding bears. Yep, bear cavalry. You can't you can't beat bear cavalry. Um, so and then, and then these have tanks, and they're kind of your your general. They look sort of I don't know East European kind of thing, Russian kind of. These are your cards. Now they're they're actually not they're not good card stock. There are decent card stock. But they're not particularly the nice glossy. They're very, they almost feel like just normal cardboard. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, well you don't you didn't you didn't sleeve these. You always sleeve everything, Aramite, because you're just fastidious like that. And I say, well, the reason I didn't sleeve these is you will occasionally put new gold coins. There's a sticker that we put a new so South Africa's worth two gold, whereas Venezuela's worth one. And these gold coins can be used to buy new troops. This is how you take risks now. Rather than matching your cavalry, uh, infantry, and cannon to make a risk, now you, if you sort of, to get this card, if you own Southern Europe and you win a battle, then you get to take a card. You get one card. You can only do that once per turn. So if you own Southern Europe and you win a battle, you'll get this card. This one has two. So that's nice. Whereas, you know, Western United States, we went absolutely crazy and now it has three on it. And the reason then also why I decided not to put any sleeves, well, they don't probably fit in any sleeves, but also um, you can rip these cards up. Let's say somebody wins and they really don't like one of the winning, if you win the game, uh, one of the things that you can do to alter the game, because no matter what happens, if you win or lose, you're going to be able to alter the game in some fashion. And if you win the game, you have several choices. And one of those choices is you can rip up a territory card. And I mean rip up. It's gone. If we rip it up, there is no more Western United States card in the game forever. No more at all. Uh -uh. So that may be if somebody continuously wins because they're always getting this, you know, three gold point Western United States, or, you know, of course you can go up to six, then one person gets mad and says, well, I'm winning the game and I'm tearing that thing up. So that's kind of neat. That's kind of neat. You know, there's all sorts of... Then you've got these things called... Uh, these are just your, your resource cards. These are just general. If you don't have a place, if you win a battle and you don't own any place that's available, because there's certain cards that come up, then you're, then you're just going to get one of these gold coins. And they, they're just worth one gold coin. Now, if you've, if you've never won the game, you start with a red star, which is a victory point. And every HQ of a side is also worth a red star. HQs are kind of these nice little hexagonal things. Let me pull one out for you. I love this one because I think it kind of reminds me of Thundar the Barbarian, if anybody's seen that, is that uh, the, the Fremen looking people went, live in a, it looks like a, looks like a, a crashed bomber. Kind of like how those people in Thundar lived. Well, it's not going to... There we go. How the people in Thundar lived in that yacht that had crashed. So this is also worth one victory point. So in the beginning of the game, your HQ gives you one victory point. And if you've never won the game once, so with the very first game, nobody's ever won the game, so uh, then you start with two victory points. You only need four, so that means you either... Uh, can turn in four cards of any type, doesn't matter what's gold on them, to get a victory point, or you can take two HQs. So in the very beginning of the first game, you're gonna, you're, everybody only needs two more. It's gonna go fast. I had one game go 30 minutes. 
well, maybe, maybe even 20 minutes, because I sort of, uh, yeah, it was, it was a sneaky move, but I, I sneaked in and got two HQs and won the game. Other games take a little, can take a little longer. If you've won the game, you start with a missile, and missiles uh, basically turn one die roll to a six. So these are kind of neat. Every time you win the game, you get a new, you get a new missile. So that's, or nukes, they're actually really, they are nukes. They're cool. They're, they're nuke, nuke missiles or whatever you want to call them, tactical nukes. And so that's neat. And as that goes on, you know, sometimes too, whenever, if you use too many missiles, then you're going to open it, you're going to open some, something up. That, that could be a new thing you've got to deal with. So uh, let me show you our board here. So let me just pause and I'll, I'll move this out of the way and show you the board. Well, I promised you it's risk, and it is. So here we go. We've got, we've got our board here that we've made. Now your board will look the same, but will have different stuff on them. So, in a sense, you're looking at a board, I'm giving you an example of a board, but it's not the one that will be yours. There are stickers I've, we've placed, and I'm not actually going to tell you what these stickers do, other than some of the general ones. These are called scars, and they do different things. So, these came in the very beginning of the game, there's, there's several scars, and there's some scars on here that are, are, are a bit of a spoiler, like I said, I'm not going to tell you what they do so that you, you just don't know. But the scar here is a bunker and it comes out, so it means that the defender adds a plus one to their higher die. So the, his or her higher die. So that's really kind of neat. Nothing huge, but it means, and look, we've, we've been sort of savvy about it. So coming in to Europe from Iceland, so that choke point now, has a better defense. On the other hand, they have ammo depletion, where the defender subtracts one from the higher die when defending. So it's easier to get into North Africa from here. Or over here, we've got uh, an, an ammo depletion in Southeast Asia. So easier to get into Southeast Asia. And these came as a result of everybody gets these scar cards in the, in the very beginning of the game. And these came as a result of us just playing scar cards down onto the, to the map at a key point during one of our games. So you, you make that decision, and sometimes you just do it because you really need that, that particular place. And sometimes you do it so that you, you can defend. Like, <laughs> we have over here, good old North America. See, it's got, actually, if, you, if the North American player takes Iceland, they've got a nice choke point for everywhere but, but Alaska. Now, you notice we've got some blue ones, and these are cities. There's major cities, and there's minor cities. Minor cities just add, basically, a one when you're counting for population. Major cities add two. So, if you owned Peru, Brazil, Venezuela, you would, oh, Peru, Brazil, Venezuela, you would have a one, two, three, four. If you owned Western United States and Eastern United States, you'd have one, two, three, four, five. So when you're calculating how many troops you get, that's going to give you extra if you own these cities. So that's kind of cool. And the major cities are founded by people who have won the game. That's one of the things that they can choose to do. And when you found a major city, that's a place where only you can start the game. So this one is a friend of mine named Jim. Jim now can, only, can start the game there, and nobody else can start the game in the western United States, which I showed you was actually worth a lot of money. So somewhere down the line, I have a feeling that we're going to be ripping up the western United States. And then my... Uh, then down here, my father actually won, so he's the only person can start in uh, the Western Australia, and he also decided to bunker that. Now, you can cancel out these scar cards. You can't ever cancel out the, the well, I'm not going to say ever, because I don't know. The cities stay well th where they are mostly, but the scar cards can be canceled out by the winner. The winner can do, do several things. They can name a continent. We haven't had that happen. Our winners just founded cities. That's typically what you do in the, the very beginning. You want to have a nice starter location for yourself. But you can name a continent, which means that you get a, spe a special bonus. You get an extra troop if you ever own that continent. So I can see that someday my dad will want to probably name Australia and then he will have a, t a city, and then Australia for him will be worth three rather than two. As the winner, you can also modify either plus one or minus one a continent's bonus of troops. You can destroy it, you can cancel out a scar, you can rip up a card, and even if you didn't win, you get to found a, mi a minor city or put extra gold on a place that you owned. So that's really neat. There's all sorts of different things that you can do to really make the game your own game. 
So I'm not, I can't talk too much about it because it's really your own thing. And it's a neat mechanic of every time you play, something happens. So you kind of keep wanting to play. You, it makes you want to play. And so when you win, you no longer get that free red star. So the two people have won the game. They're going to start now. My father and my friend Jim have won the game on this particular board. So they're going to start with missiles each, but not a red star. So some of us will, the rest of us playing, will start with victory points. We'll start with red stars. So it will be easier for us to win the game. And the missiles are good, but they're not anywhere near like a victory point in goodness. So it sort of balances out. If you particularly, if you're the guy, if you're the last person to win, so let's say you're playing five players and you keep playing the same five players over, and you haven't won, and everybody else has won, you want to found a city or something, um, then you're going to be only needing two places and everybody else is going to be needing three victory points. You're only going to need two victory points. So it does in some ways balance the guy who didn't, who hasn't gotten to win and do something cool. Eventually it becomes a lot easier for that person so they'll be able to do that. Um, general risk combat rules. The one thing that threw some of us learning it, because we hadn't played since our, our early college days, was that if you start, you start in a place and you put all your people in a place. So I think you start typically with about six or eleven men. I can't really remember off the top of my head. And then you will have, if say, five players. Unless somebody starts right next to you, you're going to have a lot of empty space. So you can attack into empty spaces. It's called expanding and put as many men as you want. And basically just that will build, instead of doing the old round robin of I'm taking Russia, oh I'm taking the Northwest Territory, and putting one person in each one, you basically just make that a lot easier by I'm starting here and I'm expanding out and there we go. And it does make it a little bit more simple, particularly on Australia or the smaller continents, Australia or uh, South America, you're going to be able to get that almost in the first turn. And we typically do. What it, the game did sort of degenerate last turn, last time we played, into people holding continents and then, th then each, time, each time we were just doing one attack till we were able to get more, just to break a continent, till we were able to find some massive way. And you'll find that just like regular Risk, you're going to sort of have a detente for a while where it's a trade-off just to get those cards, and then eventually somebody's going to go crazy, and they'll probably fail, but then the next person's going to go even crazier and they might succeed. So that's, and again, as you change the board, the victory is going to be different. The people are going to be harder to win. For certain people, it's going to be easier to win. For others, then more stuff is put on the board that's going to affect the gameplay. Like uh, this scar, which I'm not going to talk about, is, and, and you do name your cities, by the way. I just wanted to say that. We, we got some like Frankport, and then uh, decided to do New Frankport. <laughs> to be funny. And then uh, I named one Arland because it was in uh, East Africa where the pirates are. So there's Arland. So uh, yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got different, different things that's going to happen. So it's really kind of neat. Or sy syndrome for Stockholm. <laughs> yeah, I know. Cheesy. Uh, but this definitely appeals to the cheesy, funny, crazy players. So let me talk about then, then how I feel about the game. I think you probably already know, but I'm going to talk about it and just give you some, some ideas of how, how this might affect you. Let me preface this by saying that I hate Risk now. I hate it. I used to play it all the time. We played it, my family played it, my dad played it. We played it all the time when I was a kid. We played it in college. When I became a hardcore board gamer, so when I first started play, playing other games was uh, Settlers of Catan. So once I, I got that gateway game and then we went into History of the World. And then we went into Twilight Imperium. So in college we ramped it up. We played things like Catan, Acquire, played tons of Catan, Acquire, History of the World, Twilight Imperium. This was the second, uh, wow, second edition I guess of Twilight Imperium back in those college days. And I had, after getting to be a hardcore gamer, I hated Risk. I never wanted to play that stupid game again. It was seven hours, and all it was was rolling and dumb. And, and yeah, okay, so I, we, we used to play in college Risk 20, 2150 or whatever it's called. And that's still seven hours of stupidity. And, and yeah, there's cards and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, 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 it's not fun. And it seemed like it's all random and, and silly. And then there was Lord of the Rings Risk, and that's even more unfun because you got to wait for that stupid ring to get into Mordor to end the game. So... You know, I just, I, we, I fell out of love with Risk. 
Risk Legacy, Rekindle the Love Affair. Mostly, two reasons. The red, point, the red star system is brilliant. It takes what you hate about Risk, the long, long game, and it makes it into something a lot easier. I only need four of those things, so if I've never won, I only need two. If I've won before, I only need three, because you start with your own HQ, it counts for a victory point. So, in a sense, that makes the game go for an hour, or two, sometimes. As, as everybody starts to win, they all, and everybody needs three victory points, it, it's going to get a little longer, but you're also going to get mission cards put in. I've, I've not gotten to the mission cards, I don't know where they are, I'm not even, whatever, I don't even know how they work. So, that's something that, you know, it's, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to different avenues, just like in the old Risk, it's going to lead to different avenues for victory. There's also event cards that, that go in. I'm not going to talk about those because, guys, please, no. You don't want to know. It's spoiler free. So the event cards, those will do crazy, crazy things, and they get to be kind of wild and wacky, and that's just going to add some spice to the game. So, in a sense, this rekindled my love of Risk because it's so much faster. It's what you like about Risk, just having a silly game, beer and pretzels, root beer and pretzels if you want non-alcoholic, whatever. And, uh, you know... Silly game with friends, you can laugh, you can chat, you can go, oh my gosh, don't you break my country, I'm going to come after you. You know, you can threaten, you can cajole, and you just have a good time, and it takes an hour, and by the end of it, at the sometimes the post-game is actually the most fun. Now that's why, again, the second this is rekindled my love of risk, is the post-game is more fun almost than the, pre, than, the, than, the, than the game, because then you get to alter the board. The losers get to do certain things, and, and that's all fun, and, and, and there's nothing bad. Even if you've lost, you get to do something, so you have a lot of fun deciding what you want to do. If you've won, you get to do even more awesome things. So if you've won, you get to decide, and you're naming things, and you're joking, and you're laughing, and people are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you did that. And, you know, if you've got, you got your off-color crew, you can have an off-color board and all sorts of horrible things. I was playing with a, a very tame group, so we were making fun and, and still having a good time, you know? It's, it's changing the board, and that post-game is just silly. And, and by the end of, of 15 games, you're going to have pretty much all of the stuff out, is what they say. Not all of the things open, but all of the board changes that are, that are general, like cities things like that, 15 games will, will tend to set the board. Um, I do think that that also means that 15 games will, will pretty much get almost all of your things opened. Um, so there's, there's something to look forward to. Now, now that doesn't mean you, you play 15 games and you trash the game. You play 15 games and you play the game that you've customized. The customization is, is part of the fun, but also the end result of once you've customized the game, that's the game you guys wanted to play. Your friends, your group wanted to play. So that's the game they created. That, by the end of 15 games, that's the game you'll have. So it'll be, in the theory, the perfect game of Risk for you. It's the one that you wanted to do and the one that you guys, your group, created. So it feels special. Now, there's some caveats on this. The main caveat is, if you don't have a gaming group that you meet with over and over and over and over, the same crew, this game is going to be very difficult to keep going. Um, and this is, I mean, like, I'm, I'm addicted to this. I really, I mean, I can't, the next time I have a gaming day, we're going to at least get one, of, one game of Risk Legacy, if not two, and then play something else maybe. I don't know if we'll play it all day. But I think we'll have to because I, I want to get this, this board rolling. I want to see what goes on next. It's sort of this the, the addiction of exploration. You know, you got to sit there and not open up. You want to open up those things even though you haven't done it just to see what's in them. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Because that ruins the game. But uh, you want to have the same, you know, same game group play this over and over because it's not going to be as fun. If they at least get, if you're doing five player games, then at least try to get four or three, even if you have to, three, because the thing is that if you do a five-player game and you guys have a lot of fun and, you, you know, some of your people put new stuff out and then you, you decide to do a three-player game and then, then you do a five-player game, you know, on a different date, that, the two players that were left out go, hey, wait a minute, you guys put in a new city. Oh, that's not fair. And you guys played twice and, you know, I didn't get a chance to mess with that. So, you know, you're going to want to try to keep the same group over and over and over so that you you get that board to evolve with that same crew. At the very least, if you play with five, you're going to want at least four of those people, I think, um, to keep it going and not to make some people feel left out when a couple of games go by and they weren't there. 
Um, it just depends. You know, obviously you're not going to be able to, some people like myself are not going to be able to get the gaming group over and, you know, together as much as some other people. So it, it's something that you just got to play with and it's something that you've just got to see out. But I think you're going to want to have a gaming group that's pretty static and be able to play this. Where I think these type, this type of game is really great are play people that have a, a gaming group that meets, like a, like a gaming guild that meets over and over and over. That way you can always have fun. It's kind of like the sidebar thing, like we just played something kind of deep and thoughty. Let's play something stupid. We change the risk board, have a lot of fun, you laugh about it, then we'll go back to something playing, play something thoughty. Um, then so if you have a group or a youth group, like something that meets every Sunday or something like that, and you, you I will say there's a few intense things that I'm not sure you're going to want young, young children to, to see. Um, I can't talk about those because some of them are more intense than others. And of course, you, you are talking about, you know, warfare and, and death and killing. And so you, you do need to think about that. I guess you're not going to want to play with too young of or at least be able to to be, you know, talk it through with the people who are there. I think the game is rated for 13 and up. I don't know if that's necessary, but they're covering their bases because there are some intense themes. But like a youth group that meets, something like that, we're going to meet over and over and play. Um, the other caveat is, if you don't have that, then you might have two groups. Like, I have two groups. And that's a problem because those groups don't always meet at the same, actually, three groups, but the but those don't the the one is not a risk legacy playing group. But if I have two groups that play love to play this, and um, if they don't meet, you're, then the best thing you're going to do is want to buy two boards, and which is what happened is I bought this. I actually my mother bought this. I had my mother buy this for my father for Christmas because I just knew he would love the idea, and we played and played and played over Christmas about four or five games, and had a good time. Um, but then. I knew that I wasn't going to get that same family group together very often. So I was up here, I was getting another group together, but they weren't all the same people. Some of them were the same. So Dad decided to surprise me and bought me one of these so that I have these. So now we've got two. So in a sense, the exploration element's going to be a little lessened, but you can play with those different groups. So it may lead you to, be, to buy multiples of these if you've got different different groups. And it's not a cheap game, so I'm not so sure that that's a, an economical situation, but it's one where you can have two different boards, and you might even want to buy two if you have the same group, because maybe you like you'll have two different worlds, and they do have a serial number on it, so it's kind of cool. It's your world, it is yours, you sign it. So maybe you just want two different worlds with two different things and go different paths or whatever. Um, now, the third caveat does not bother me, but it might bother some of those listening. You rip up things, you, put, you write on the board, you alter your game. Now, if you're one of those fastidious people that can't even imagine ripping up a card, I will say first, get over it. It's a fun game. Stop being silly. Number two, if you just don't think you can get over it, then don't buy Risk Legacy. Because I think the, the coolest part of this is the changes, is the impacting the game as you play. Otherwise, you're just sort of playing a game of altered risk. Um, which is fine if you like that sort of thing. If you're one of these hoity-toity war gamers that says, Well, I don't like Risk anymore. I'm way better than I'm only hexes. Get over yourself. Give it a try. If, particularly if you've got children, you know, kids that are younger, maybe, like I said, you want to be careful with the intensity. But some, it's neat. This is a mechanic that people are going to just say, oh, that's so much fun. It's cool. And kids are going to love it because I'm going to name it Puppy Town and, or whatever, you know, or name it after their, their favorite toy, oh, Megatronville or whatever. And... You know, people are going to have a good time. So even if you're the hoity-toity war gamer who feels like they're too good for risk, because I certainly felt that way, then give it a shot. Because it's so much fun. And relive the old glory days of when, when it didn't have to be so complicated. When you were a kid and just rolling the die and having a whole lot of luck and just hoping that you got it. And if you didn't, you didn't. I mean, you're still going to get the times when you're, you have superior forces and you've rolled all this and your opponent is defending with only two people against ten and they just keep rolling two sixes. You know? And so you're going to have that. It's risk. But it's a, it, then at the end when you didn't win, when that, when that guy then came back and took all over, you still get to found a city. You still get to maybe you put, a, you put a coin on something you owned. Yeah, you get to do something, even if you didn't win. So you have a lot of fun. 
So get over yourself. Get over yourself if you have a problem altering a board. That's what this board is for. If you worry about it, buy multiple copies. Uh, keep one pristine until you finish this one and then decide what you want to do with the pristine copy. That's what the board game is for. So ripping up stuff, messing with stuff, that's what it's designed to do. And if you think you're just too good for risk, well, maybe you are. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's okay to have that beer and pretzels or root beer and pretzels uh, experience. So I think from the Electronic Air Mites perspective, oh, no solo play on this one, and I really think you're not going to want to play it with two players. If you only can ever get two players, you can, oh, you can have fun. You can have fun because you can do two players, and of course it'll only be one of the two people impacting the board. So you can still have fun if you consistently play the same game with two players. But I don't think it's going to be the same. It's a party game. This is definitely on the, on the side of a party game because part of the fun is just discussing what you're going to name stuff and how you're going to do things. So I think it's a win-win. I give it four red stars, if you, if you will. I think it's a winner for all of the reasons that you shouldn't like it because it's silly, it's, it's crazy, it's not strategic, but it has that beauty of discovery. It recovers a nostalgia uh, of, of excitement that Risk used to have for you as a kid and you can still now as an adult have that nostalgic excitement. So I think if, if you like that sort of thing, if you think if you, it's almost worth the price of admission for the innovation of the, of the board that you change. Components are all, for a board that you can rip stuff up, the components are all very good quality other than the cards and that is meant to be that way. Everything else is of a good quality. So it's, it's definitely something that, that even after your 15 games, it's going to last. So I think give it a try. And, and see if you like it. Obviously not a game that has a lot of resale value if you don't like it, but maybe you'll, if you don't, open it up, see what all the special things are, and use it for other games, because they are really neat pieces. So, anyway, this is the Electronic Aramite saying that don't rip up your other board games just because you get addicted to doing it in Risk Legacy, and I hope to see you soon. Play on.